Thank you for joining us. Tonight, we have the honor of hosting author and master beekeeper, Frank Mortimer. He will be in conversation with award-winning actress and beekeeper, Francine Locke. Frank's, Frank's book is Bee People and the Bugs They Love. It is one man's journey from bee curious to master beekeeper. Bee people swarm with buzzy facts about the seeming particulars of beekeepers. To quote Frank, these require commitment, practice, attention, and following the advice of more ex experienced beekeepers, which many newbies don't do. Take it away, please, Francine Locke. We're so happy to have you with us tonight. Well Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to finally meet you in person, Frank, in person via Zoom. Um, I get to be an ABC now, so actor, beekeeper, and a chicken whisperer. So we have, I've, got, I've got one more up on you, but I've enjoyed your book. So everybody, this is his book, which you'll see next to his head. Um, and this has been a, quite a journey for you, hasn't it? Yeah, no, it was. I really enjoyed doing it. And it's funny, I didn't start out to write the book. I just started out doing bee stuff. And then... Um, for, to raise money for my club, I would do all these talks. And then like, it was like after like 125, I'm like, why do I keep doing these talks? But it just, it made it, I kept practicing how to explain things to non beekeepers. Mm -hmm. And so it got that really good at those, my analogies, which are in the book. So it's easy to understand what beekeepers are talking about from the outside. And we do talk a lot as beekeepers, don't we? Yeah. Uh, it's really kind of funny as you say that with, you know, the stories go on and on and on. I would go to a convention for film related business and people would say, oh, you do those live from the high videos on YouTube, don't you? Actually on Facebook, but I would show people the inside of the hive and I'd have a, a live video going and they would remember that and they wouldn't say, what are you working on right now? It's like, well, we got bees. So I, I get what you're talking about bees. We, we talk about them and it gets exciting, doesn't it? It does. And well, what, what is awesome to hear you say um, is that like I, there was a president of the state organization here in New Jersey. And he said, it doesn't matter what you do. Once you start keeping bees, you're going to be known as the bee man or the bee lady. And yeah. here you are with such a great career and people are coming up and asking you about <laughs> bees. That is awesome. <laughs> the bees on Facebook. It's like, yeah, but but the film. So no, but but it's fun. And it's I've been told, you know, it's so exciting listening to you because as a beekeeper, you you learn all of these amazing things and you keep on learning more and more. And I don't think you ever stop learning. Uh, it, these are the best bugs ever. And we got a lot of bugs down here in Georgia. These are the best bugs. It, stinging aside, but um, yeah, it's it's easy to talk about them. It, the problem is trying to rein yourself in. I'll look at a group of people and it's like, okay, what do you want to talk about? Because you've got to focus and that's hard. You, you have a hard time with that or do you just say everything? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, well, or what I'll do is I'll ask for permission before I just start rambling or going down a rabbit hole. But I, uh, I do try to keep as best as I can on the, um, you know, so, so everybody understands it. But I also ag agree with what you just said that the bees in Georgia are special. And what's interesting is that a lot of people up in the Northeast actually get their bees from Georgia and will bring them back up. So in some ways, the genetics uh, of New Jersey bees are actually Georgia bees. Well, yeah, none of them are American bees anyhow. So what the heck? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And it's for those that don't know, honeybees are not native to North America. But what I think is also interesting is like how many of the plants they pollinate are also not native. You know, like think like, uh, you know, George Washington chopped down a, a cherry tree, apples, right? Mm -hmm. An apple a day. Neither of those things are native to North America. Right, right. The, the early settlers brought, brought, brought everything over and what they call them, white man's flies, because that's how the Indians knew that we were coming because here come the bees, they're leading the way for us. Yes. Yeah. And that's, it's fascinating to hear about that too. And just imagine like, like what I, I would, I sometimes think what would it have been like to be here before any of the uh, European settlers brought all that stuff over, you know, yeah. I mean, like all the tasty fruit and stuff comes from other places. So. Right. Right. But 
thinking about how easily the bees managed to get from the East Coast and spread their way across the country just through their own capabilities, basically swarming, making a new hive and expanding. Think about today that they're all being trekked all over the country in semis. Nobody realizes that. They don't, when people talk about getting the honey from some of the big box stores, it's like, well, yeah, it says local on the label, but you don't know if it's local to California or Florida or North Dakota because it's local but a big truck carried those bees all the way around the country following the pollination cycle. That's why I always say it's best to, to know your beekeeper. Yeah. So support the guy down the street who has bees um, and buy their honey. Now, how many hives do you have? I, I only have two hives right now. I had at one point, I had five um, a couple of years ago and through a series of events. And one was a very, very small, you know, paltry little hive. Um, but last year was a kind of set back and, and hold off on what was going on. So I've kind of gone up and down with, um, I wasn't here very much last year. So one by one, um, I mean, there was a swarm that occurred and what was fun though, was the year before when I caught my own swarm, I'm sure it was mine, you know, they had labels on, <laughs> um, but I, so I just started over and, um, and so this year's a building year and they've got the hives there, they're thriving. I'm so tempted to take one of them and split it, but it's like, well, I don't want to do that because you just, why risk having two halfways instead of one overly full hive? So this one hive is just going gangbusters. Yeah, there is doing well, but um, so I've gone up and down, but not, um, I think you have what, seven hives, did I see? I'm, I'm up to 15. 15, oh gosh, <laughs> where do you find the time? Yeah, I mean, that, it does take time. It does, and that's, and it, it like I say, some people will play golf or just, you know, watch TV. My, my free time, I just go to the bees, but I'm at my limit. Like, cause I, I do it as a hobby and in my, an, an addiction, I guess is a better way to say it, but I, I can't go above 15. No, it's there. That's too much. It's at least though, you're not trying to put on a bee suit when it's 95 degrees with 112% humidity. That's, <laughs> that's the killer down here. It's just so hard to want to get suited up and, and go out and check on your hives, which of course we know you've got to do. Yes. It's, and that's, I, um, I've been moving to more of just a veil that ties around mm -hmm. um, just because it, it, while Georgia would definitely have a lot more humidity, we do occasion less frequent than you do get high temperatures here, but mm -hmm. by just having the veil on um, it, it does make it easier. But yeah, I always say like, how do you know beekeepers are crazy? Because in the hottest months of the year, we put on a jacket, hat, and then we hold fire. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so seeing to it as, I mean, you and I can talk about this stuff all day and all night long, but let's let some of the viewers understand why we've, you know, what is a veil? A veil is not like a wedding veil, really. So you explain a veil and I'll explain something else. Why don't we give some of the viewers an idea of what we're referring to, because there might be people, there will be people that have no idea what it means to raise bees and a beehive and all the components. So you tell them about the veil. Sure. So what a veil is, is it's essentially like, think of like a window screen in your house that's connected to some sort of hat. And the purpose of it is, is to keep bait bees off your face, but giving you visibility to see what's going on. Cause that's like one of the things I really like about beekeeping is how it involves all your senses. So it's your eyes, your ears, your nose and touch. And so you need a veil that does both protect you, but it's still easy to see through. But you're protecting just your face. What about your hands? So if some people wear um, like leather gloves. I like to wear the nitrile gloves. Like mm -hmm. I just buy them at home Depot, um, which I believe is headquartered. <laughs> I, that uh, so, but the nitrile gloves they give enough protection that if a bee can sting through it, you can just kind of click up on it and it'll take the stinger out right away. That's um, good, yeah. Yeah, I how have. About you? Um, what, what do you wear? Um, I'll it depends upon the hives, really. There was one year that I had the nastiest darn hive, and it was like my second or third year. And my husband was like, okay, you got to either do something with that hive or I'm going to do something. We would be on our deck and this is, I don't know, a good 30, 40 feet from the hive and the little bars would just come on, boing, you know, they, they get you. Um, so there, when I had a hive like that, 
I couldn't walk anywhere near them without basically either going quickly or being totally suited up. So I'd have the leather gloves. Um, sometimes I'll do this, the, the nitro gloves by, you know, my first, the first pair of gloves that I bought, I love them. They're goat skin, so they're real soft and you can feel everything. And they've got the long arms. And then I've got the, I have both the helmet with the veil that crisscrosses with the strings across your chest and around your waist. Um, with the jacket, but then the jacket is so warm being a heavy uh, cotton that I've also got one of the suits that are very thick, but it's a made out of a foam fabric also. So it's kind of like a double layered fabric. And that way, presumably the bees can't actually sting through that, but you do get a breeze through that. So you can basically be naked in your suit and nobody would know. <laughs> so that's <laughs> secret there for Georgia beekeeping. <laughs> um, but other times, like right now, the hives that I have, they're, they're lovely. I was feeding them yesterday and I was you know, quick about it, but I popped open the lids and um, you know filled them up with some nice sugar water. And I didn't even have my veil. I was like, oh gosh, I've only got 10 minutes. I don't have that much sugar water. So let's just see if they'll be nice. And you, know, you can tell from the noise that a bee and yes. the hive makes what's going on. And so when you hear this hum, this buzz, it's, it's kind of soothing and, and it, it feels good. It doesn't feel threatening, but you know when that hum changes to a higher pitch noise. And if there's one little bee that's, zzz, you know that that's time to better be protected or you walk away. So these two hives have been lovely. They're, they're kind, I'm kind, I, I feed them. I'll, I'll be out on my deck and it's like, oh, here's a little bit of extra sugar water, I'll put the bowl out. And I'm just taking pictures of them, you know, to right, right there. And, they don't mind me. They're just thirsty. I mean, it's been a, it's been dry here. And right now it's with the middle of summer, everything is so hot that you really have to feed them. Otherwise they'll just eat all their honey stores. Yeah, and, and then for people listening. So when the reason that we feed bees is, um, is two reasons. One, that bees have to uh, eat or consume up to eight pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. And so when we're trying to get them to build out their, their hive that will feed sugar water. The other time that we do that is when there's a dearth. And when the dearth means is that the nectar flows of all the plants have shut off because they're done blooming. So you feed the bees then. It's important to note that beekeepers do not feed the bees when they're trying to collect honey because that would be sugar water, not honey. Right, and the mixture of sugar and water is exactly what the bees need to thrive and survive. So we'll feed them in the fall here because that's, they've got to enter the cold season with a totally stocked up hive, you know, nice and heavy that's loaded with honey, but it's a, it's a sugar water honey. We're not going to ever eat that, but they've got a cap and they're ready to have that to help them survive over winter. So yeah, we feed them in springtime down here. And, and, and some of the things that I might say and Frank might say could be a little bit different, but in, in Georgia, we're gonna feed them in springtime because come January, the queen has started laying again. So there'll be a couple of days that might be 40 degrees and you'll see bees coming out, just checking things out. Um, so we feed them in springtime as they're building up. Then we stop feeding because once the flowers are blooming and the nectar is coming out, they're going to fill up their hive and all of the extra supers, which is the honey that we're allowed to take as beekeepers with honey. And then come fall, you just wanna make sure that your hive is very, very well stocked with honey so that the bees can survive the winter. And yeah. do you do the same time frame up there? It would definitely be a little bit later than you, but we do do the same thing. So, cause like up in New Jersey, in the Northeast, I should say, that uh, bees need between 80 and 100 pounds of honey per hive to right. make it through the winter. And, um, and so when we talk about weight, we're, we're able to judge that because um, if you think of a hive like a filing cabinet and each drawer of the filing cabinet, there's 10 file folders. And in the boxes that are for the bees, each of those file folders can weigh up to 10 pounds. So we just count how many are filled with honey and that's how we're able to estimate if they have enough to make it through the winter or not. And the old beekeepers here, when I say, well, how do I know how much honey there's? Well, you just pick up the hive and you just tilt it a little bit and you'll know if it's heavy or not. Yeah. <laughs> there are different ways to, to estimate it, but that's, that's true. And a lot of us, and well, I do, I've gone down to the eight frame hives just because of the weight. So if you have, if you need to pick up a box from your hive, it's going to be, 
45 pounds of these and honey is like you're bending over just to ship the box over to see what's going on in the box underneath that's a lot of weight so we yeah we, i've gone down to the eight frames that's yeah I, a lot of i've known people that do that as well for bending over a tip actually from the university of guelph ontario mm -hmm. is that he brings out a bench um and he sets it next to the so it's a portable bench and right. then that way you can put it on that as opposed to going all the way to the ground and that has saved my back. Oh yeah, I've got a couple of little stands out there. Anything that I think, oh, that would be something I could use somewhere. Quite often it ends up being down by the hives because I've got little, like it's actually, I think one of them is a tool stand. It's just a metal stand. So it's not going to um, rot in winter time you know, with the rain in springtime, but I've got that and I've got a couple of cinder blocks. So I just, yeah, I, gotcha. we make do with whatever, whatever's necessary. What do you put in your, oh, Smokers. Why do we use smokers? Yeah. So it's um, the reason we use smokers, which I have one here, is um, because it's a little one. It is. I use <laughs> I use wow. that just for demonstration. I don't it's not um, an actual in use smoker, but uh, the bees communicate two different ways. One of the main ways they do is through smells or pheromones. And so there's guard bees at the front of the hive. And they, that if there's any kind of predator trying to get in, then they'll let off an alarm pheromone. And so by using a smoker, we're able to block that pheromone. So it's like I say to kids is that if they're in school and they hear the fire alarm, then they know to go outside. So imagine the smoker working that even if that fire alarm is going off, that the kids can't hear it and they just keep going about their business. And that's what keeps bees calm. And mm -hmm. the thing I always say is that um, around the world, wherever there's honeybees, there's all beekeepers have two tools in common. One is the smoker and then the other is the hive tool. And, mm -hmm. um, but back to the smoker, what's interesting is that, you know, there's cave paintings that are over 30,000 years old of people collecting honey. We also know the ancient Egyptians actually had hives that they kept like beekeepers. They hollowed out logs. And um, in all that time that this, the smoker that we use now, the modern one, was invented in the US and that that's along with a few other innovations all within a 15 year period in the late 1800s. And now those things revolutionized beekeeping around the world. Yeah. Interesting that the monks figured out how to, uh, they were the first ones that figured out to smoke the bees out of the caves, the, the crevices where they'd have their hives so that they could remove the comb and the honey without destroying the hive without destroying the queen and the cells and all the babies and the larva, which is what people used to have to do before we had our modern ways, right? Yes. Yeah. That if you, if you've ever seen pictures of an old fashioned hive, a skep, um, it's like the basket upside down basket. And those were used up until the, the mid 1800s. And to remove that, that beekeepers would have to either get all the bees out and get them to start all over again, or in some instances they would kill the bees and then so they can get the honey. But then in 1851 in Philadelphia, Reverend Langstroth is who discovered the modern hive. And what he discovered is we now call bee space mm -hmm. and it's three eighths of an inch. And what, what he discovered, and this is in, in nature too, just if in feral hives in, in, where we would find them, that bees maintain that three eighths of an inch between the honeycomb that they build. It's kind of like their hallways. So by maintaining that, they don't crisscross the comb and that's why we can remove it. And then, as I said before, if it takes eight pounds of honey to make a pound of wax as beekeepers, we want to reuse the wax that they built so they don't have to continue to use resources to, to make that. So right. that's, we get more honey. <laughs> yeah. And in the old days, and even some people today will remove the, the wax from the hive, from the, the wooden frame that holds it, all the wax the, and, uh, and all the capped up honey and they'll do a, a strain like a squash and strain it and then they have all the wax and then they have the honey separate and they get to use their wax for making candles and lip balm and all the different products but for me I like to make a little bit less work for the bees come springtime so right. I'll just remove the cappings and extract the honey and then hopefully keep those frames nice and clean for the next year so that they can just start filling them instead of having to start from scratch and building them. Exactly. Yep. That's what I like to do too. Um, and I just, I just find it, you know, as we said at the beginning of this talk that honeybees aren't native to North America. Yes. Here yet here in the U S as we made all these innovations and discoveries. Right. 
uh, discoveries of how they're doing it naturally anyhow, because they learn all this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and I w- we've got so many other things to talk about, but I don't want to miss this one question that came up. Uh, we've got somebody who is thinking about getting bees and thinking about or asking about a flow hive. Now, have you worked with the flow hive? I mean, everybody has sent it to me, you know, different videos and, and pictures and whatnot, and I'm very familiar with it. And I actually had the opportunity to uh, do a trial run on one. Have you worked with the flow hive at all? I do you want to describe it for anybody who's watching that may not be familiar. So the flow hive is, if you've seen the, the videos on Facebook, where it just has like a spigot outside of the box and you turn it and then the honey flows out into your jar. Um, so Wow, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. it's, it, it, it's like everything that if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably isn't. Um, and what, what my concerns with the flow hive is that the way it's marketed is it's saying, Hey, you don't have to do all the work. And as you said, Francine, at the beginning, bees take a lot of work. And so, um, that like honey, when nectar comes in, it's uh, up to 80% moisture or water. And part of how the bees make that nectar into honey is they boil off all that water. And so one concern would be that if you're not looking in the hive, it might not actually be honey yet. It might just be nectar. So when you put that in the jar, it's not, it's not going to last. It's going to ferment. And then, so that'll go, you know, and that's not honey. The other thing too, is that depending on where the queen is laying in a, in a hive, you know, it's like the, the bees never, the queen, especially the queen, she never reads the books. So she may go up and lay up top in the hive. So if you go to open it for honey, then you could actually be getting bee babies in it. And, um, Last is the expense. When you look at how much the flow hive is compared to a traditional system, you're going to be spending five to 10 times as much. Yeah, what I find um, somewhat disingenuous in the marketing, you, everybody and the person who's asked the question, I'm sure has seen the videos of what looks like a nice, lovely hive sitting on top of the second box. And so that bottom box is where all the babies and the queen and the brood would be living. And they would have a, um, uh, oh my gosh, my, my brain just went a queen excluder. So there'll be a, a little bit of a screen from one level. If you've got your, your frames with honey and with uh, babies and brood, then there's a little bit of a screen that's large enough for the worker bees to go back and forth, but not for the queen to get through. So as long as you've got a good sized queen, she's not going to go back and forth. So I wouldn't be as concerned about having brood in the flow hive. But the fact is you still have to go through all of the same maintenance work that you do with a regular hive because you've got this bottom hive that you have to check for disease and how they're reproducing and is the queen active. And if she's laying in one box here in Georgia, well, you want to have two boxes that are full. So where's that other box? Because they're not showing that at all. So you've bought, you've bought this unit, which has the all the little chambers up on top that you have to crack them open and it's it it moves two sides that all the honey presumably drips out um, in an environment where it's warm all year round. Maybe that's not a problem as much, but I've, I did have a flow hive from the bee club. I, I borrowed it and nobody actually wanted to keep it because it, they were not successful with, uh, with using it. So I had this darn thing on top of a very full hive and this was two years ago. And what happened is I ended up losing that hive because they never, uh, the colony just didn't really, they didn't work it at all. They stayed in the bottom. They, and eventually they just absconded, but the bees wouldn't do anything up there. They were filling up the bottom levels. I had a jam-packed honey level downstairs and nothing on the top. And I had all kinds of problems trying to take out full frames of honey and put in an empty one so that the queen would have room to, to lay her eggs. It was a mess. So personally, I do not recommend the flow hive. It's, yeah. And I'm sure that there are other people who would say, oh my goodness, I love the flow, but I haven't met anybody like that. Yeah. I was very shocked to see that there's a hive that you can get as a wall hanging on your house, inside your house. So it's very, very decorative and it's pretty. It's a shape of a honeycomb and you can watch the bees and you can see all the work that they're doing. And there's a tube that you lay, you lay down and it goes outside your window so that the bees can come in and out through their little tube. 
great. Bees make a lot of mess in a hive, not dirt mess, but there's wax and there's propolis. And so it's not that it's gonna be a pretty little wall ornament. And for the bees to come in and out, well, that's great. What happens when it's cold outside? What are they going to live off of? So if anybody watches this and says, well, gee, that's like a really dandy device. It, it might be a good wall hanging, but it's not good for the bees, so. Right, and, and then so you use the word, beekeeping word propolis. And so what that is, is if, if you've ever touched a plant, it's real sticky, that bees will go and collect that. And then they break it down with their enzymes and they'll then use that um, for two different reasons. It, they spackle in their hive, I call it. So that's why when I said that the other tool that beekeepers use is a hive tool, it's because the, the propolis is so strong that you can't lift the pieces of a beehive apart. And sometimes the wood will break before the propolis will. The second thing, and this is what's really interesting, and because I love, I love to get into how bees and flowers evolve together. And so why do plants make that sticky stuff? Because it's like, it, it, it's essentially a band-aid for that plant because by putting that goo out, the sap, then it keeps anything from getting in. And so the bees collect it and by spreading it out and making like an envelope of it in their, in their nest, they actually are fighting um, viruses that are coming in. So it's kind of like, if you ever had a grandmother who went around spraying lights all over her house, the bees are doing essentially the same thing with the propolis. It smells a whole lot better though. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, have you ever gotten into taking the propolis and uh, making a tincture from it? Have you done that I, yet? I, I did collect propolis once. I, I didn't do anything with it, but I, I did love the smell of it because it just, in, in, in the smell, it's kind of a combination of honey and beeswax with just a little bit something else, but it just, it smells so beautiful. Yeah, it does smell beautiful. You hear the, when people, beekeepers talk about cracking open a hive, that's, you hear the cracking, the separation of one level of the hive or the, the lid of the hive from the other one, because that glue that the bees use, the propolis, it really is that strong. I took the lid off of my hive uh, day before yesterday and the feeder was stuck to it because it was on the, I didn't have one extra layer in there. It had only been in there for three days and the bees had already stuck them together so yeah it's antibiotic antibacterial just like honey so honey by the way everybody never goes bad um and there are a couple more questions so i know that we can go back to honey never goes bad and being found in ancient tombs two thousand years old it's still good honey uh denise was asking let's see here do you sell other products or just honey is it possible to make a living from beekeeping all depends huh yeah. So I, yeah, in addition to honey, I also make my own hand cream that contains the wax and honey from my hive, as well as other ingredients. And then I make lip balm, which almost uh, is exclusively from beeswax. And uh, what I like to say about my uh, lip balm is it's better than Burt's. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Bees, Burt's bees. <laughs> and so, yeah, there's and that's like the great thing about beekeeping. There's always new stuff to do and to learn. And one of the things is all the products that you can make. And so um, it's really up to you. Like candles is something I haven't done, but I would like to do. Um, there's people for, that, that like to make booze is, a, is an entry into beekeeping. Mead, which mm -hmm. is one of the oldest alcoholic beverages in the world. And which is why the monks liked having the bees there. They had all of their honey for their religious ceremonies and their wax. And then they had the mead. Yeah. <laughs> so they can relax on the weekend when it's over. And meat, so meat is essentially, if you mix it with water and yeast, it's like honey wine is what mm -hmm. it's also called. Um, so uh, there's all the stuff you can make. Can you make a living? Sure. There's a, there's commercial beekeepers. There's probably less than 4,000 in the whole U.S. Um, there's a lot of them in Georgia. But uh, to make a living, like I'll give you an example, New Jersey's largest commercial beekeeper, which is big for New Jersey, but not for Georgia. He has between 8,000 and 10,000 hives. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it really is a whole other world. Like I say to him that he, that I'm making little Lego models. He's building New York city. I mean, that's just the difference in scale. Yeah. And that's it. That's a difference in scale. So um, hobbyist beekeepers like we are, well, I enjoy making candles and uh, harvesting the honey. And each year, the honey, by the way, it tastes a little bit different depending on what the bees were collecting um, or where they were collecting the, the nectar from. I've, 
what is the um, what's the master beekeeper's name who actually does the the sampling? It's just like a, a wine connoisseur. Have you had them at your bee club? Uh, the um, I, I, she's in Connecticut. I think it's red. It might be red barn bees. I'm, I'm forgetting her name though. She did a book, the honey connoisseur with Kim Flottam, but I There's can't. There's a title for them though. Yes, and I can't remember. I, okay, good because I couldn't remember think <laughs> what the name was. But just like with tasting wine and if you've ever, ever read the back of a wine bottle and hints of pepper and a nice chocolate and a you know a little bit of oaky flavor and the, the bees connoisseurs also know exactly what goes into that honey we bring our um our honey into the club in springtime and they can tell you well you know it's like 90 percent um tulip poplar and you know 10 percent privet which is privet isn't good but but they can tell you exactly what it is they're they're so well developed their taste sensation that's um, so great yeah and it's and just so everybody knows like so honey's color and taste is a hundred percent dependent upon what flowers they go to um and that's why there's the difference year over year because of the percentages of what plants they go to change and also why honey um, from around the U S or even, even smaller, like around Georgia would be different. Like in, in Southern Georgia, you get Tupelo honey, mm -hmm. which is only available there. And in Northern Florida, um, which comes exclusively from the Tupelo plant. Right. And what's interesting about that honey is it, um, so, and I'll get into this in a second, but it's Tupelo is higher in fructose than it is in glucose. And that means that the, uh, Tupelo honey will never crystallize. Oh, I didn't know that. <clears throat> Well, one thing that they do here in Georgia, if you're anywhere near the mountains, is some of the beekeepers will take their hives up to the mountains because sourwood grows up there. And it's got to be at 10,000 10, foot elevation. And the sourwood honey is highly prized. It's a very, very light, um, light flavored, light colored honey. And so in our markets, you'll have the wildflower, orange, um, tupelo, sourwood. I actually like the dark honeys, uh, the more robust, the buckwheat. Got it. Yeah, I, I'm 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 more of the opposite. I like the lighter honey. Now, have you ever tried one? It's available from Oregon and maybe Southern um, Washington State. It's called meadow foam. Mm -mm. So meadow foam is a plant that grows in the woods, and the reason it got its name, it's these little white flowers, and it looks like think of like the foam on the ocean, but it has that look through the, through the forest. Huh. And and honest to gosh, that if you taste it. It tastes like marshmallows. <laughs> the, the first time that I tasted honey from my hives, I sort of thought there was something wrong with it. It was so sweet and it was so rich tasting. It just seemed like a foreign product. And it wasn't until my taste buds got used to, this is what honey is supposed to taste like. If you're used to eating wonder bread and you have a good rich piece of sourdough you don't know that there was something that you were missing that's i had no idea how honey was supposed to taste last year my son said oh this is your best honey yet mom i'm like he noticed the difference in flavors yeah um, and that's i like to do that with tastings is i'll bring out several of mine because i harvest my honey um in june and then in july like late july mm -hmm. august and just by the difference of six weeks will change the flavor of the honey so I'll bring those to a tasting and then I go and buy a, a jar of the cheapest junk that I can get at a supermarket. And then it's like, you know, mind blown when people will taste what honey's supposed to taste like and then taste that. And then you can really tell that what you've been buying at the store is not actually honey. Right. You, you don't know that until you've got them side by side. Uh, we've got somebody asking about your honey songs. Oh. So this person has over 25 songs so far. How many have you got? I believe I'm right around 25 as well. And there is a Spotify um, playlist that you can find my honey songs. Um, and it is, I think it's Frank, the B man is what the, the Spotify list is, but yeah, oh. I, uh, and I talk about this in my book, so maybe that's where it came from, but I, yeah, I, I have a playlist that when I'm out driving to my bees, I listen to the songs over and over again. <laughs> I'm not obsessive at all. No, no, not at all. <laughs> so, um, question from joe he's talking about the two major roles and joe's a beekeeper too because he says as beekeepers we have two major roles so all three of us and whoever else is listening so we're the primary care physicians and all the maintenance managers so i guess that he probably might have a little bit of a medical background too 
Could you talk a little bit about these two roles and the time and the cost for each? So the first one was physician and what was the other one? Maintenance managers, primary gotcha. care physician and maintenance managers. Yeah, and, and, the, um, and I think that's a great way to say it, Joe, that uh, think of ourselves as the primary care physician. So we've all heard that bees are dying and bees are in trouble and that's worldwide. And the reason is, is there's a non-native parasitic mite called Varroa destructor. Um, and what var Varroa does, so think of like a tick and the, uh, imagine a tick that's the size of a Frisbee on your back. And that's what the size of this tick is in comparison to the bee. And so the tick does two things. One is that it um, will feed off of a developing bee, when it, a larvae. And so if you think of like prenatal nutrition and imagine if there was a parasite sucking the nutrients off. Second and, and scarier than that is that the mites are a vector for diseases. So the mites are now carrying um, eight viruses that affect only bees, doesn't affect people. But so think of like this pandemic we're living in and imagine that bees can't socially distance. I have tried to get my bees to wear pollen masks, but they refuse. Um, so the because bees are on the same flowers, then these mites are able to spread those viruses pretty rapidly. So what beekeepers do is, and, and, and for non-beekeepers, the joke about beekeeping meetings is we'll talk more about mites than about honeybees. And um, so what we have to do is we're constantly monitoring to see not just the mite levels, but are we seeing any signs of the virus in the hive itself? And then, because it's not, if your bees have mites, it's how many mites per hundred bees do you have? And then if it reaches above a threshold, then we have to use specialized medicine to treat for those mites to keep our bees healthy. And then as far as the maintenance management, that goes to everything from, um, you know, we've talked about the, um, the propolis build up. And sometimes that means that inside the hive that, um, that we're breaking wood because the propolis is so strong. So we have to keep that going. We have to make sure that the bees have enough resources back to the sugar syrup that they can build out their comb, which is their, the, their buildings and their rooms. And then, you know, outside of the hive, we have to cut the grass and keep everything in, in good shape as well. One thing that Joe had mentioned asking specifically about about the, the time and cost for you. So I would think that the primary care physician, probably like in, in a doctor's office, they have the more specialized tasks of medicating the bees if necessary, checking on the bees' health and medicating them. So they would have greater cost because when you buy the medication for a hive, um, one is very inexpensive, but the device that you use to apply it is more expensive. So there are a number of different products they all have their pluses and their minuses, but as the primary care physician, the actual diagnosing of the patient might not be that time consuming, but you're playing the role of maintenance manager also. So then is it the maintenance manager that's coming out there, schlepping out to your hives with all of your gear and your smoker and your tools, and then you're opening each hive and you're looking at each one. So the maintenance manager is doing all the heavy lifting and the working and, and diagnosing goes to the physician but it's sort of a hard way to, it's difficult to just separate them. You don't, your hive most likely doesn't need to be regularly medicated, but you have to be aware of problems that will come up and you learn that over time. It doesn't, you can read everything in the world about bees and it will take you a lifetime, but you're still gonna learn more. And I'm, I'm just gonna segue into this next question because I don't, it's about uh, Georgia. Um, person's asking how to learn about bees in Georgia and keeping them, you know, decision of do you want to actually get bees or not. There are a number of local bee clubs, um, depending on what part of Georgia you're at, you can go on Facebook and put in your, your area. I'm in Gwinnett. So there's, here, there's the Gwinnett, there we go, Gwinnett Beekeepers Club. I had to get that shirt in there somehow. Nice. Um, but you find the, on Facebook, you can find different beekeeping groups and you, you'll find a group of people that are very, very happy to give you information. Maybe they'll mentor you, but it is time consuming. So it's not that you can say, hey, you wanna meet me at two o'clock for one hour? It doesn't work that way. So you can, your job, if you're thinking about getting bees is to look at a lot of videos on YouTube, get an idea of how it works. Um, look at the costs involved because it, it, the, it, 
initial outlay is somewhat significant in case you're thinking, oh, it's just gonna be get a handful of bees and you're good to go. It's not. One frame might cost you two bucks, but if you need to have 10 frames per box and you need to buy the box, you need to have the layer on top of it and the layer under it and then the lid on top of it, all those components add up. Um, but there are, like I said, there are a lot of different groups that you'll find uh, mostly on Facebook. Your area will have beekeepers, they'll have clubs. And if you find somebody local, you just reach out and you talk to them. Beekeepers are really happy to talk about their bees. So, and watch live from the hive. You'll be able to see my bees. <laughs> so now we can go back to you, Frank. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Like that's, I, no matter where you live, there's a beekeeping club. And a, in a big part of my book, I talk about, that's how I got into beekeeping was I found out there was a local club in New Jersey. And it surprised me that, you know, we're 15 miles from Manhattan. Um, so we're really in the, in the bedroom community of the city. And, mm -hmm. and we're, I'm also in the most densely populated county in the most densely populated state in the country. So it was surprising to me that in this very constricted suburban area, that there would be enough members to support a bee club, but there are. Like we have in my club, in just this is just the top part of New Jersey, one county essentially, we had um, at, pre pandemic 260 paid members. So um, it, if you, so to me, if you can find beekeepers outside and even in New York, there's a New York city beekeeping club. So right. they're, they're, they're everywhere. Um, and I even tell a story in my book that um, when I went to Sweden, I did what most people do when they go to Europe. I found a local beekeeping club and then hung out with strangers to look at bugs. <laughs> Great. But you got free honey, right? Got yeah. taste it? Yes, I did. <laughs> but are you familiar? Are people in, Manhattan, are they like putting bees on their roofs? You know, in a lot of cities in Europe, they're doing that. I don't know how much it's, how popular that is out here. Yeah, there's, um, in New York, that's generally what they do um, because there are bees in Manhattan. Like, and it made the news a few years ago that a swarm, which is a big pile of bees, landed on top of a hot dog cart in, in Times Square. I and remember so, that, yeah. yeah. And so that hive was probably the one that was on top of a hotel um, in man in, in Times Square that that that's why they swarmed right but, okay um, yeah so no, let's, let's talk about bee swarms because people you know you think about the movies and the swarm of bees and they're attacking me and there's thousands and thousands of bees yeah there's like you know 30,000 bees flying around are they dangerous no so I, it, that so first of all why bees swarm is is that if you remember from high school biology with single cell organisms the way they reproduce is they split in two so that's what a colony of bees is doing that they will, and it's only healthy colonies that will swarm. So the positive to tell yourself is, hey, my bees are healthy. Um, half of them just left, but they're healthy. Um, so what they do is they create an, a new queen, which we can get to in a second. And then right before that, that new queen will emerge, the old queen and half the bees leave. And then they go and they hang somewhere in this big ball, which we say they bivouac. But when they're, they're in that big ball, that before they have left the hive, they consume as much honey as they can because they don't know when they're going to eat again. So in that big ball, they're like us on Thanksgiving day after we've eaten, they just, you know, they don't want to move. And honeybees are defensive for one or two reasons. It's they'll defend their hive or they'll defend their life. And so because when they're in that big ball, they have no instinct to defend because that's not a hive. And then, so unless you go start squeezing them, they're not going to sting you. And I, when I go and collect swarms, I, I don't wear any, any veil or any gloves. I go like I'm the shirt I'm wearing now. And I actually have pictures of me with my hand holding the bees and they're all over. Cause again, it just to show people that they're, they're gentle. And that's, that's a big part of what I think that beekeepers have to be as ambassadors for what we're doing. Because as you described, you know, so many of us grew up from those, those bee exploitation films of the 70s, or as I say, the old Bugs Bunny cartoons where the bees came out like a big fist to get you. Yeah, that's right. And that's, that's, not, that's not how bees act. So by being ambassadors and showing the general public what it's like to be around bees, then people don't get as nervous. And, and it's very true. But when you see people on YouTube, you'll see a video maybe of a woman covered in bees and you see these unique situations and wonder, well, all bees must be like that. And that's not true either. The reason that you can have 
you could be covered with bees and they're not going to hurt you is because you've got the queen. Frank right. mentioned earlier about the pheromones. The queen gives off pheromones that calms the entire hive. If the queen is healthy, all of those bees know that she's healthy and they're happy and they'll never do anything. They're never going to feel threatened as long as you're not going after them, but they're just going to stay with the queen. So when that queen flies out of the hive to find a new place to live and she lands someplace, all of the bees, tens of thousands of bees follow her. And that's what that ball is. It's a whole ball of bees around one single queen. It's, I mean, it's totally amazing, but that's when, like Frank says, you could hold the bees in your hand. You could just, it's like a river of bees. They'll just follow that queen wherever she is. And that's, and that's one, like I said earlier, like what I love about beekeeping is that it does involve all your senses and then bees, their entire body is covered in uh, fur. Like they, bees even have little tiny hairs growing out of their eyes. Mm -hmm. And so when you're touching them, they feel like little fuzzy, what they are, little fuzzy animals, but you can actually feel that fuzz. And um, another point about bees is that the male bees, which are drones, don't have stingers. And so like what I have two daughters, they're now seven and four, but since the, the oldest one has been two or three, I'd bring home drone bees so she could play with them. Oh, and, okay. <laughs> and in my book, there's a picture of my older one with a bee on her nose. And, uh, but the secret is, is it's a drone. Which it's a not... drone bee, so it can't sting her. Right. Well, yeah, now they're... Go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I was gonna say they're, they're covered with little bitty hairs, but you said they're soft and that's, I got news for you. Their feet are not soft. I'm outside gardening and sweating. And when I'm doing that, and all of a sudden, you, you know, buzz, buzz. And I mentioned before that when a bee buzzes gently, you know, there's nothing to worry about. So you don't swat it and be a land on my shoulder. What do you want? And she's walking around and you see her little proboscis, her tongue coming out and she's drinking up the salt and the, and the water on, you know, on wherever it is that she lands, but their feet are sharp. I mean, it's not that it's a, just a gentle walking. It's like when your cat with nails just accidentally kind of catches you, they've got pointy little feet. <laughs> so they're not just gentle little, you know, <laughs> bits of fur on them. Yeah. And that's, and the, the bees feet, it's like, if you think of in our houses, our hallways are horizontal, theirs are vertical. So they have to climb up and down, which is why that they're equipped with that kind of equipment. And it's interesting too, like if you've ever seen um, like with pollen or like if you buy in a store, the bee pollen's little balls, what that is, is that when, when bees are flying to the flowers, that they get almost like a static charge because of that hair. And then when they land on the flower, boom, all the pollen sticks to them. Then on one of their legs, they have like a built-in comb and they comb all that pollen down. And then on their back legs, they have built-in saddlebags. So they push all those grains of pollens down. So they have these two big balls and then they'll fly back to the hive. Um, it's just, as you said, it's fascinating. And then bee pollen has more protein per ounce than chicken breast. And so that's one of the advantages of eating it. And bees, the reason that they'll eat the protein is for when they need to produce food for the developing babies, like adult bees that aren't taking care of the babies, they'll consume just nectar and honey or carbohydrates, which I am willing to see if I could survive on a pure carbohydrate diet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I don't think so. You gotta be, you've got to be healthy if you're a beekeeper. So I don't think you could just live off of the honey. <laughs> yeah, but I'm willing to try. <laughs> uh -huh. No, you know, when I'm extracting honey, when little drips here and little drips there, after 15 little drips, like, okay, I've had enough. It's, you don't need that much. That's the thing about honey. It's so much sweeter than sugar. It's, it's, it's rich. It's sweet. It's a completely different product than either you know, big jugs of store-bought honey or trying to sh sweeten anything like your, your tea with sugar it just doesn't work. Yeah. And since you brought up sh uh, sweetening your tea, so what's interesting is that it takes 12 bees lifetime work to make one teaspoon of honey. So if you use a teaspoon of honey to sweeten your tea, 12 bees made that. And, and then how long is their life? Six weeks. Except and, in yeah. wintertime. So that's, uh, yeah, in the winter, there's always exceptions, right, to the rule. But what's interesting is that, so if it takes 12 bees to make a teaspoon, it takes just under 1,200 bees to make one pound of honey. And that one pound of honey meant that those bees had to go to 2 million flowers. And to get to those 2 million flowers represented a total of 56,000 flight miles, which is twice around the equator. And that's for one pound. And then, as I said earlier, the bees for themselves to make it through winter need 80 to 100 pounds 
And that's before we start taking up honey for ourselves. And yeah, and they only live for six weeks. <laughs> In summertime. So yeah, and, and some of the numbers will be a little bit different for the north as for the south. So our bees don't have to live, have to survive as long in frigid, frigid temperatures because our winter's shorter and it's not as drastic as it is up north. But isn't it amazing that inside of a hive, inside of the ball of bees in the hive, there's always activity there. The bees don't hibernate, but inside of the ball, what temperature is it going to be? Oh, the bees surround the queen. Okay, this is winter time. All the bees conglomerate around the queen in the hive. So what temperature is that queen center of that ball going to be at when it is 45 degrees outside? It's between 92 and 97 degrees Fahrenheit. How about when it's five below zero? 92 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit. But they're bees. How do they get warm? <laughs> yeah, it's, and that's what's so fascinating because like what bees do is they can uncouple their wing muscles and then they can move. And then by all of them doing that, that they can actually generate heat. And so that's how that middle of that ball stays at temperature. And the reason that Francine and I both know that temperature range is because for the babies to be able to develop properly, they need to stay within that temperature range. It's phenomenally, it's just phenomenal. I mean, all of the little specific points about the bees from being able to dislocate their wings, like we use different words, we might have different numbers for amounts because put two beekeepers together and something's going to be different about them. Put three beekeepers together and you get four opinions. Right. But the bees in the South don't have to stay compacted so tightly for as long. So they might not need to have as much in terms of a honey store to last the winter. In the North, they're going to need more. They're going to have to be all clustered together a lot longer and the temperatures are going to be much more severe but they still somehow managed to survive. Pretty, pretty amazing, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's like, if you think about that bees are native to everywhere from Sweden to the Ukraine, all the way to warmer places like Italy and Spain. So it's, it is just amazing. And that's like, so my book covers all of these facts as interwoven with the stories about my journey through beekeeping. You know, one thing that um, really fascinates me and it's particularly my husband, my husband is a pilot. And bees, if you watch them slowly, you'd think that these thousands of bees that are coming out of a hive, they ought to be bumping into each other because they're leaving the hive, bees are coming in. How do they figure out how not to hit each other? And they've got these lumpy little bodies with these itty bitty little wings. It shouldn't be possible. But when they leave the hive, they fly, they can just about fly almost straight up. It's amazing that they can do that because we can't, we can't do that with our technology. It's either a helicopter or it's a plane. But when they leave their hive and then they have to find their way back, they do it from basically an internal GPS. So right. when, a bee, when the bee's job is to leave the hive for the first time, it sets its GPS. You'll see a bunch of bees. They've left at you know, three o'clock in the afternoon and they're kind of going back and forth, up and down outside the front of their hive. And it's obvious they're not flying into the hive and they're not flying away they're basically setting their GPS. And after that, it's done. That's where they, they know their hive is right there and that's where they're always going to come back. From then on, they go out and they do their business. They'll travel four miles away from their hive and they manage to get back to that specific hive. If you take that hive in the middle of the day and you move it four feet away from its location, those bees no longer have a home because that's where they live. And right. my husband is a pilot. He's like, you know, our GPS in planes is not that specific. It's not that precise. The bees, it's, it's hmm. fantastic. Yeah, no, it's, it's so, it's so interesting. And then like how they're able to navigate, um, like they have three extra eyes in, in their head that you can't see. And they, they can tell the polarity of the sun, which is what they not only navigate by, but they also are able to give directions to the other bees of where food sources are. And they do that with a dance. The dance is called the waggle dance. And what's wild is on the entire planet, there's only two creatures that can give directions to food sources. Bees are one and the other is people. <laughs> Turn left down yonder at the red tree there. And then you go on two miles down there in the next block over. Yeah. Or you go inside of a pitch dark hive and you dance around and you go forwards and backwards and ups and down. And you let a whole hive full of bees, all the ones that are leaving there, know where that nectar source is or where their pollen source is. They do it in the dark. The other yeah. bees figure it out in the dark. I mean, how is that? How is that actually even possible? 
Yeah, the, uh, Tom Seely, uh, who's one of the top bee researchers in the world out of Cornell, did a lot of uh, studies on that. And in his book, uh, Honey Bee Democracy, he talks about how they're able to, to do the dance and then also how bees decide on where they should go. Um, so, and I talk about his research in the book as well. Say that Frank is yeah. wonderful. He's written this great book. He tells you all about bees, like from the start to finish and um, reading it's like, oh yeah, I know about that. Oh yeah, I know because that's what beekeepers go through. And even when you described your very first club that you walked in and there's all these grizzly old guys there. Yep. That's beekeepers. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, that's what I, I like about the book is that it talks about the people. So it's not, it's not a how to book. And um, it's, it's a focus on the different characters that you've run into. And that's one of the things I've enjoyed as I've done these talks around the country is people are like, man, you could have been in our club by these guys that you're describing. And, uh, and then too, my favorite part of the book is the mistakes that I made. I have one whole chapter dedicated to some of my colossal mistakes because uh, they're so big that the world of beekeeping can learn from them. <laughs> we all do. If you haven't made the mistake, then you haven't really graduated yet. It's just... It, it, that's how you learn. So I yeah, think it's, it's seven o'clock because we're getting kind of nudged on the side here. <laughs> well, um, I before we close, uh, I want to introduce to you a special guest who's just going to speak for a minute or two, Latifa Rashid. She is an associate from our Duluth branch of the library, brand new uh, branch that we have. And she's going to tell you a little bit about what you would care about that's happening in her branch. Latifa? Hello everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Latifa. I'm a supervisor at the new Duluth branch and we just want to invite you all to come out and experience the new Duluth branch which features our very own observational hive which you can see is located on the wall behind me. It's just in the children's area. Um, it's getting a lot of use, a lot of excited people um, and children coming in and looking at the hive. So we want to invite you to come out. I'll post the address in the chat. Um, so come visit us and come talk about some bees and come get some books. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Latifa. <laughs> Everyone, please remember that there are beautiful book plates if you purchase your book from Eagle Eye Bookshop that Frank was nice enough to sign for us and we have turned them over to the bookshop. So check out Eagle Eye Bookshop please buy a copy of this book. And we thank you so much, Latifa, Francine, and absolutely Frank for coming to us from New Jersey and spending the evening with Gwinnett County Public Library. We're very grateful. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Bye-bye.